people are trying to find the United States in certain aspects of the Bible. But friends, this morning we are going to search, we are going to find the United States in Bible prophecy. And we're going to show just what role the United States is going to play in Bible prophecy. But before we dive into this subject this morning, what should we all do? We should pray, amen? And friends, um, we really need to pray that God will help us to see the significance of Bible prophecy. Because let me tell you something. Prophecy was given for mine and your benefit. Can you say amen? It was given for mine and your benefit. The Bible tells us in the book of Amos that God will do nothing except He reveal His secrets unto His servants, the prophets. And all throughout His Word, He has shown us beautiful, precious promises and has given us all the details that we need to know, that is necessary for us to know, to, ex- to see exactly what would happen and how everything would play out in the future, friends. So we have no excuse. Amen? Amen. Amen. So before we dive into our presentation this morning of the USA and the Bible, let's have a word of prayer and go to God. Father in heaven... We're so thankful again, Lord, for another wonderful Sabbath day that you have given us. Another beautiful holy day, Lord, that we can come before you gathered together, Lord, with humble hearts and humble minds, just willing to learn from your word and learn what your word has to say to us. And so, Father, I pray right now that you will be with us and give us understanding, Lord, as we study your word, as we study the book of Revelation this morning. God, impart to us wisdom and knowledge, but not only wisdom and knowledge, Lord, help us as always to apply that wisdom and knowledge to our life. Lord, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing if we don't apply it. But no, Lord, we know that we can only apply it in and through your son Jesus. So God, give us uh, that ability to apply it to our lives. To come and abide in our hearts and our minds and change us, Lord. Take this vile heart, wicked heart of ours, Lord, and change it and make it new. Take this vile mind of ours that's been tainted and stained with all of the sin of the world and renew it, Lord, and change it into your likeness. We thank you and we love you and we ask you all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. The USA in the Bible. This morning, friends, we are going to find the United States in the Bible in Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, this is the big, kind of like the climactic point of Revelation. Most people, when they read the Bible, they read Revelation, they go through chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and onward. The book of Revelation reaches its climax of absolute chaos that's about to break out on the earth when you get to Revelation chapter 13. You see these two beasts. How many beasts? These two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. One is rising up out of the sea and the other is rising up out of the earth. And you see as you read Revelation chapter 13, these two beasts come together and they form an alliance. And we read about how the first beast had been given his power and his seat and great authority by the dragon, by the devil himself. And the second beast that's rising up out of the earth, they have very detailed descriptions that the Bible gives us, which we're going to go over those. But they, they, they form this coalition, this alliance between these two beasts, between these two kingdoms. And they begin to bring in what was referred to as the mark of the beast, which would be the last great final deception before Jesus would come back. That would separate the, the sheep from the goats, so to speak. That would separate the wheat from the chaff. That would separate God's children from Satan's children. And so, friends, this is the last deception given in Revelation 13 here that the world would experience before Jesus' second coming. So, if we're dealing with two beasts in Revelation chapter 13, we have to first identify what do beasts represent in Bible prophecy? What, 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 what is representative of a beast in Bible prophecy? Kingdom, that's right. Kings or kingdoms. And we get this from Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23. It says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms. And it says, And shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. Now we know the fourth beast in Daniel 7 here was speaking of Rome. We also talked about Daniel 2. You have kingdoms here being represented as metals. We have the head of gold, which represented what kingdom? Babylon, the arms and chest of silver represented two kingdoms. What were they? Medo Persia, the right arm and the left arm. And then we know that the, who overthrew Medo Persia Empire? Greece. Greece came along. And who overthrew Greece? Rome. And then you get down to the ten toes, ten divided toes. And that was the ten divided what? Kingdoms or regions that Rome broke up into in 476 AD. Then you have the, 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 the uh, clay mixed with the iron down there at the bottom of the Daniel 2 image. And what did the clay, what did we say the clay represented? 
There you go, the church, the church. And we get that from the book of Jeremiah chapter 18. makes it very clear that the church is representative of the clay. And so no doubt about it, you have church and state amalgamation at the bottom of this image. Well, when you go over to Daniel 7, God has repeated and enlarged upon this. And he gives us in Daniel 7, in this chapter that we just quoted from, he gives us four beasts. And these four beasts are the same exact four beasts as the four metals over here in Daniel 2, except God is giving greater detail about these four beasts now. In Daniel 7, we see there was a lion that came along, had eagle's wings, and, and this lion was representative of what nation? Babylon, the head of gold. And then there was a bear that came along with had three ribs in its mouth, Representative, representative of the three kingdoms that it overthrew in its rise to power. And the bear comes along, raised up on one side, and overthrows the lion. So who overthrew Babylon? Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia overthrew Babylon. Now Medo-Persia overthrew uh, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt in their rise to power. And so that representative of the three ribs in its mouth, it was raised up on one side, symbolizing that one of those kingdoms, the Medo-Persian Empire, was more powerful than the other kingdom. And we know that was the Persian Empire that was more powerful than the Medes. And then you have a four-headed leopard that comes along and it overthrows the Medo-Persian Empire. And what was the kingdom that overthrew Medo-Persia again? Greece. And we have a four-headed leopard because Alexander the Great, after his death, his four generals overtook the throne and they began to rule over Greece. And then shortly after Greece, you have another iron-like beast that comes along, this dragon-like, iron-like beast that comes along. And it overthrows Greece. And what kingdom historically and biblically overthrew Greece? Rome. And so we see how Rome ended up becoming the fourth kingdom. And it, we, we, we learn in Daniel 7 there that when you get to the fourth beast, you have ten horns. So you have ten toes at the end of the last beast over here. Or ten horns, rather. Then you have ten toes over here at the end of this image. So we know that these are one and the same, no doubt about it. These ten horns were also representative in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24 as ten kings or ten kingdoms. And so we know that Rome became divided Europe in 476 A.D. And this ushered in this beast that Revelation talks about. And Revelation 13 is basically giving more information on the Antichrist beast that we read about there. And this beast was said to have the eyes or, or, the, or the mouth as the mouth of a lion it has seven heads and how many horns ten horns so it's synonymous with the fourth beast in a certain format that were, was rising up in daniel chapter seven so we have ten horns in daniel seven we have ten horns in revelation 13 except this beast takes on a little bit more descriptions god gives more details about this beast here that we see on the screen by the way does this look like a friendly beast no, this is a very ferocious, very scary, fierce beast. It has, the, uh, the, again, the mouth is the mouth of a lion, seven heads and ten horns. And, and we see that upon its horns it has ten crowns. And we see that this beast has the feet as the feet of a bear, according to the book of Revelation. And it has the body as the body of a leopard. Now we're going to come back to this beast and we're going to talk more about its specifics and what all of that means towards the end of our presentation here. So you see this beast coming up first in Revelation chapter 13. Then shortly after that, John, he's in vision on the island of Patmos and he sees another beast coming up shortly after that beast received a deadly wound. And this beast that he saw coming up was not coming up out of the sea like the Antichrist beast was, but this next beast was coming up out of the earth according to the word of God. Now let's go into Revelation 13, beginning in verse 1, and let's read about this first beast. Revelation 13 and 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, how many crowns? Ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of what? Blasphemy. Now what did we talk, what did we talk friends, about what blasphemy represents and what it means? Taking the place of God in the form of what? In the form of what? There's two definitions of blasphemy in the Bible. Claiming to be who? Claiming to be God. And then there's another form of definition we see in Mark chapter 2. Forgiving sins, that's right. When, when we claim to have the power to forgive sins, when we have not been given that power, we commit 
blasphemy. We see this from John chapter 10 and verse 33 and onward, and then Mark chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 there. We see that those are the two definitions given in the Bible for blasphemy. So this beast power is being, being told us, is being convicted here or being condemned for what? For blasphemy. So a beast represents a what? Kingdom. So this is a kingdom that has seven heads, ten horns, and upon its horns, ten crowns. So now, now here's the thing we have to understand. We've already talked about the beast that the harlot woman rode in Revelation 17, have we not? Now a beast represents a what again? A kingdom. So this woman, what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church. This woman uh, represents a church, and this woman in Revelation 17, this great harlot that's trying to deceive the world into drinking her wine and into taking in her doctrines and her teachings. This woman is riding a scarlet-colored what? Beast. And this beast was given very specifics that it has seven heads. Do we, does this beast here have seven heads? Yes, it has seven heads, and it even goes as far as to say the beast has ten horns. Now, we know that the ten horns are synonymous with the ten regions that Europe divided up into, no doubt about it. But what does the seven heads symbolize? Does anyone remember? You read Revelation chapter 17, and it tells us that the seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Are you with me? The seven heads are the seven mountains. So this beast power is having seven heads, so it represents the seven mountains again, according to Revelation 17, on which this beast resides, on which it, where it sits. And so we see here, in Revelation 17 and 15, we need to understand, though, what does the waters represent? Because this beast is rising up out of the what? Out of the waters, out of the sea. So we need to understand, what is the sea? What do the waters represent? Well, let's let the Bible interpret itself. Revelation 17, beginning in verse 15, it says, He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are what? Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this beast is rising up out of the sea, symbolizing that it is, it, it, it is amongst a lot of people. It is amongst multitudes, nations, and tongues. This beast is also defined as being a blasphemous beast, this beast is a kingdom that claims to have the power to forgive sins and is claiming to be God on earth. Have we already identified who this beast power is, yes or no? Yes, yes it is the Roman papal church state. It is the papacy, no doubt about it. Now friends, you may have missed some of our topics in the past before. I don't know if you're new here, to not, or new here this morning or not, but yes, this is who this beast is. Now, we're going to go through and we're going to show more information about this beast as we read in Revelation 13. It says this, beginning in verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a what? Leper. Now it's giving us detail about this beast. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a what? Lion. Could you think of anything more scary? Think about the, the detail that God's giving about this beast, about this kingdom. This is a very, very dangerous kingdom, according to the Word of God. Notice where this beast power, notice where this kingdom, the papacy, gets their power from. Let's read. It says, And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great what? And great authority. If you have your Bibles, I hope and I pray that you brought your Bibles with you this morning to church. Please grab your Bibles and let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We need to identify who the dragon is. Now, we've already talked about this before. We've already showed this before. But I just want to show it again for anyone who may have forgotten so that you see it from the Bible yourself. The dragon, here in Revelation chapter 12, is mentioned to be making war against God's people. Now, let's go to verse 9. In Revelation chapter 12. Are you there? Amen. Let's begin reading. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the who? The devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out in the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now this is referencing the war in heaven, but notice what Revelation tells us who the dragon is. The dragon represents who? Satan, the devil. So friends... The dragon, the devil himself, has given this kingdom, this, this papal kingdom, its power, its seat, and its great authority. 
So, we can see if they're getting their power from the devil, then this kingdom is very powerful, very dark, and very powerful. Isn't that right? No doubt about it. So let's go on to verse 5, and let's read in Revelation 13. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking what? Great things, and there it is again. What's that word? Blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now we talked about this 42 months that the papacy reigned. You have 42 prophetic months spoken of here. How many, how many, let me ask you this, how many days was in a biblical year? 360 days was in a biblical year. There was 30 days in each month. And so you take 42 times 30, it's simple math, you get 1,260 prophetic days, which we know would translate to literal what? Years. If you were here last night, we reminded everyone of the principle given in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 and Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, where it says, speaking of Bible prophecy, I have given thee each day for a what? Year. So we're looking at 1,260 prophetic days, which we know would translate, according to the Word of God, to literal years. So this beast power, the papacy, is told to be ruled or to rule, rather, for 1,260 literal years. Did they rule an exact 1,260 literal years? Yes or no? Yes. We saw this. They came to power in full supremacy, being the head of the church as well as the state, in 538 A.D. when the Pope became the, became the sit in the seat of the Caesars. And he said this, in, five, or in 538 A.D., he became the, to sit in the seat of the Caesars, and then it wasn't till. 1,260 years later, till 1798 A.D., that Napoleon Bonaparte sent his general, Berthier, to go and take the Pope captive, throw him in prison, where the Pope later died in prison. Now, if the leader of your kingdom is thrown in prison and dies in prison, is that a deadly wound that's given to your nation? Yes, yes absolutely so. And so let's go on to verse, back to verse 3 and let's read about this. He says, and I saw one of his heads, notice, as it were wounded to what? Death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the what? After the beast. So this beast power receives a deadly wound. Now friends, when you receive a deadly wound, does that wound heal immediately? No. If you receive a deadly wound, it's going to take quite some time before you actually recuperate from that injury. Isn't that right? Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right. You can talk to me. Amen. All right. So we see here that it was wounded to death, but notice what it says here about it. It said his deadly wound was what? Healed. And then as, as the wound is healing, all the world is wondering after the what? After the beast. Friends, have you been seeing the world wonder? Have you been seeing the world wonder after the beast? Yes, the world has been wondering after the beast. Uh, I was at a, a car wash back in 2016, and I was washing and waxing my, my wife's car. Uh, we had washed the, the car, and, and, uh, and then after I washed it, I began to wax it. And I'm sitting there, and how many of you have ever waxed a car before? Raise your hand high and proud if you've waxed a car before. Okay, you know it's a laborious job, isn't that right? When you wax a vehicle, it's a job, especially if you're doing it by hand and you don't have one of those nice little grinders that will, has the little pad on it that'll take all your, your hard work away. You gotta scrub all of that wax off. And I was there, I was scrubbing all this wax off, and this guy, he comes up to me and he says, Hey man, he said, I got a, I got a, a buffer. If you need a buffer, you can buff all that out with real easily. And I said, Well, hey man, I appreciate it. And there was like a little business over there where they would detail people's cars and stuff. So he came over there with an extension cord and he gave me the buffer and, and uh, I start using the buffer and it didn't work at all. Like the buffer was so weak that it wasn't waxing, taking the wax off of the car. So I had to actually do it by hand. So, um, but the guy stood over there and we started talking. He says, so what do you do for a living? And I told him, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, oh really? He said, that's cool. He said, so, so uh, what, what's one of your favorite books in the Bible? And so I started to tell him, oh, I like the book of Revelation. I think it's an awesome book. He's like, really? The book of Revelation? He said, oh, I think that's kind of a scary book. I said, really? He said, yeah, man, it's kind of a scary book. It's got all these different things in there. He said, and talks about the Antichrist and all these things. And so he started, you know, having this dialogue with me. Before I knew it, his friend came out and joined our conversation. Now, his friend was his boss. 
and I'm sitting there and I'm talking with them, and they start asking me all these questions about the Bible, specifically on Bible prophecy, specifically on the Antichrist and the beast and the mark of the beast. And uh, finally, they just came out and asked me, and I thought, you know what? I'll probably never see these two guys again in my life. I need to give them as much information as I can so that when they start seeing these things happening in the world, they will remember this conversation. Can you say amen? amen. You know, I don't do that often. But when, if I think that I may never ever see those, the, you know, someone else again in my life, I will give them as much information as I can and as much time as I can give it, as clearly and precise as I could. So I, I had my Bible with me. I pulled the Bible out of the car, and my poor wife, she was over there waxing the vehicle all by herself. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I start, I start doing what I felt I needed to do, and I started sharing the Bible with them. And I'll never, I'll never forget, is that I asked them, I said, I said, well, let me ask you a question. So who do you think the Antichrist is? And they both smiled and looked at one another. And they said, we think it's Trump. <laughs> and it's funny because in almost every place I go to nowadays, and there's so many churches, there's churches out there nowadays, that the Antichrist is whoever the current president is at the time. That's what they teach. Uh, there, there was a, a, a denomination. I'm not going to mention the denomination because I don't believe in trying to cut down other churches that much. But... Um, I, there was a denomination back at, at home where I'm from, and um, this denomination every single year taught that the Antichrist was the president at the current time. And that president would move on, and he wouldn't do nothing big. No huge Bible prophecy would be fulfilled through him, and uh, the mark of the beast wouldn't be brought on, none of this stuff. But they would teach every year. It's, it's who it is. And it astounded me because, you know, if I'm a part of a church like that, and I'm going, okay, that's who it is, you know, and then they leave office and nothing happens with them. Have mercy, they die and nothing happens with them. I'm going to start to wonder, maybe this church isn't the church I need to be a part of. Amen? But, but, but it's funny, though, because um, these two guys, they, they told me the Trump. And I said, and I smiled, I said, okay. I said, what makes you think that? They had no biblical reason. They were just like, well, I just, you know, I just think he's, he's just a crazy guy. You know, he's, he, he's, he's bold and he's... He'll do anything. And I said, oh, okay, all right, I got you. I was like, well, would you like to know who it really is? And they both look at one another like, yeah, yeah, tell it, tell it, tell it. I said, okay. So I start taking them through a Bible study, and I start sharing it with them. And you should have seen these two guys. They were both standing there just like, as I was sharing with them from the Bible, the words of God, sharing with them how the, who exactly the beast power is and why it is. These guys hadn't, hadn't met me from Adam. They didn't know anything about my church or anything one of them ended up at the hospital later on, and he had to go through, um, I don't know, one of, the, uh, one of those procedures or something that he had to go through. Well, our lay pastor was an anesthesiologist, and so he put people to sleep for a living. <laughs> That's something to be as a minister, right? Put people to sleep for a living. But um, no doubt about it, he, he goes through the program. Well, this guy comes in, and he's, he's talking about Bible and different things. Well, this guy also starts kind of, you know, acting out a few things, and and, um, well, one of the doctors nearby, he asked him, he said, hey, he said, he said what, what religion are you? He said, what, 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 what church denomination do you belong to? And the guy said, well, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. This is the guy I just talked to a few days before at the car wash. He didn't know what a Seventh-day Adventist was, what we believe or anything, but that small amount of time he spent listening to the Word of God, and he thought, you know what, if I'm going to be any religion, I probably should be a Seventh-day Adventist. And so he told him that, having not known anything about our church, and I'll, I'll tell you, friends, people are wondering, though. They are wondering. And when we would share, if we would just share with them the matchless truth that God has given us, friends, their heart will burn within them. Amen. Their heart will burn within them. Don't just give them some answer. Oh, well, Antichrist is the papacy. Because then they're going to go, what? Open up your Bible. Amen. And share with them why that's the case. Let them see the proof. Let them see the truth for themselves. And you will see that their reaction will change very quickly. And so, friends, the world is wondering now, but it is our job to present to them the truth so that they don't have to wonder anymore. Amen? Amen. Revelation 13 and 4 goes on to say this. And they worship the dragon. Now, notice, who's the dragon again? Satan. Satan. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying... Who is alike unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So these people become to be so, so I guess you could say, dazed and confused by this beast, so, uh, so 
They've drunk the wine of, of the harlot so long that they become drunk in their understanding of the Bible. And then they began to profess who can make war with the papacy. Friends, if you paid attention in Bible prophecy, if you've been paying attention to news, have you not seen in news over the past decade how the world's nations have been going to the papacy for, for, for unity and solidarity for their countries? Nations, leaders, going to Rome, going to the seat of the papacy and asking them to help them create unity and solidarity within their country. Why is it that everyone's going to Rome? Oh, friends, the Bible prophesied that this would happen. So they began to say, who is able to make war with him? And it goes on to say in verse 6, and he opened his mouth in what? Blasphemy again. Three accounts they're being condemned of blasphemy here against God to blaspheme his what? His name, and get this, his what? Tabernacle, his sanctuary. We're going to be talking about that. And them that dwell where? In heaven. To blaspheme the host of heaven. It goes on to say in verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the who? With the saints. Who's the saints? God's people, God's children. God's followers, and it says, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And friends, during the Dark Age time period, no doubt about it, the, the Dark Age time period was a time period that all of the world was pretty much under the dominion of the papacy. They were all being slaughtered. Christians were being killed and slaughtered under the dominion of the Roman Catholic Church. Bibles were being burned in the streets. They told them, give us your Bibles. We don't want you having them. If you want to understand the Bible, you've got to come to us. They burned everyone's Bibles. They would kill anyone who went against their canon of tradition. And so, friends, no doubt about it, war was made against God's children. But Revelation goes on to tell us that this times of persecution that existed in, in, in uh, the Dark Age time period would be rekindled in the last days before Jesus' second coming. We're reading this now. Revelation 13 and verse 8 goes on to say, And all that dwell upon the earth shall what? Shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. All of the world now, friends, would have become deceived into worshiping the beast and the dragon, many of them not even realizing what they're really doing because they have become deceived. Remember, what do we talk about the essence of deception is? You don't know you're deceived. The essence of deception is that you are unaware that you are or have been deceived. And so, friends, keep that in mind. We should always remain humble. Revelation 13 and 9 goes on to tell us, If any man have an ear, let him what? How many of you got these things here? How many of you got ears? Raise your hands. Then we need to be hearing. Can you say Amen. And not just hearing, but applying to our life what the Word of God is teaching us and telling us to get prepared for this catastrophic event that is soon to follow. So right here in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, we start seeing a new message being given here, a new warning. We read here in Revelation 13, 11, And I beheld, John looks, and he saw another, what? Beast coming up out of the earth. So he saw the papacy come up in their rise to power and what they'd done for that 1,260 years. And now as he saw them receive a deadly wound, he sees another beast coming up out of the earth. And, you know, this beast, this is just an artist's portrayal. We don't know exactly what this beast would have looked like, but it gives us small details in the Bible as to what it would have been. But I'm here to tell you right now, friends, in Revelation 13... This second beast rising up out of the earth is none other than the United States of America. It cannot be any other, any other nation, any other kingdom. It has to be the United States of America. Now you may be saying, well, well, Dakota, you can't make that kind of claim without backing it up with proof. And I say, Amen. We have to back that up with proof. So let's show some proof. Let's go through this beast spoken of here in Revelation 13 and the second, or the second beast here spoken of in Revelation 13. We know that the second beast that comes up out of the earth comes to power around 1798 A.D. Now you may be saying, well, Dakota, how is that the case? Because again, remember, 
It wasn't until John saw the first beast, the papacy, receive a deadly what? Wound. As soon as he saw them receive a deadly wound, shortly after that, you see another beast coming to power. Now, when did the papacy receive the deadly wound by Napoleon Bonaparte? 1798 AD, which means sometime around the late 1700s, we should see a nation very strong, very dominant coming to power in the late 1700s. Isn't that right? July 2nd, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed, or was ratified rather, was, uh, I'm sorry, was rather formed and put together. July 4th, 1776, the, Const- or the, the Declaration of Independence was signed and ratified. So there you have it, the late 1700s, our nation has already declared independence, and although we were considered a small nation, we were growing very quickly. Can someone say amen? We were growing very, very quickly. In 1787, the Constitution was formed and put together. In 1788, it was signed and ratified. Are we getting close to the 1790s yet? Yes. Check this out. The Bill of Rights was formed and put together in 1789, signed and ratified in 1791. So there you have it. Now we've reached the 1790s, and our country has become a very dominant and a very more formed and organized country. Can you say amen? And we were the only dominant world power that had come to power at that time period in history. So, number one, we come to power around 1798. Yes, we do see that historically, so that's number one. Number two, this beast in Revelation chapter 2 arises in a spark. Revelation chapter 13, uh, the second beast there, beginning in verse 11 there, the United States, arises in a sparsely populated what? Area. Area. Now you say, well, Dakota, where do you get that from? Well, we just talked about how the sea symbolizes peoples, multitudes, nations, and what? Tongues. The papacy arose from a lot of people. They arose from a, a, a highly populated area. So if the sea or the waters represent a densely populated area, then the earth would represent a what? Sparsely populated area. So, again, the papacy come to power in, the, in, in, the, in Europe over there where there's tons of people, tons of nations. But now, our nation, this, this country that's coming up in the, as the second beast in Revelation 13, is rising up out of not the, not the waters, but the what? The earth. So, did our country arise amongst a huge multitude of people? Do this right here. No, not at all. We arose in a very sparsely populated area. There was not very many people here in this great land when we came to this great land in 1620 and landed in Plymouth Rock. Amen? There wasn't very many people here. In fact, many of us didn't even know there was any people here when when we came as, as pilgrims to this great country. Moving over to number three, it says, doesn't conquer another world power in its rise. Did our nation conquer another world power in its rise to power? No, not at all. You see, a lot of people want to try to say that we conquered and we overthrew uh, the, the Indian nations. But see, the issue with that is, is that the, the, the Indian tribes, they were little bitty tribes that were spread throughout the entire United States. Are you with me? They were not united as one big people. Now, if they all would have been united as one big people, and that would have been a nation. Can you say amen? But they were little barbaric tribes that were scattered. Many of them were at war with one another. Can you say amen? Many of them wasn't even in, in, in a good connections and good influences with one another. And so we, when we came to this great country, we didn't come to this great country saying, oh, well, let's go over there and conquer those poor Indian people. Or the Native Americans, if you would rather call them that. We did not, we did not come to this great country for that, that concept. We came, our ancestors came to this great country to escape religious persecution from who? From the papacy. We were being slaughtered. Our ancestors were being slaughtered over there in Rome and in Europe because of not following the canon tradition of the Roman papal church state. So we were tired of being killed. We were tired of being told what to do. And so finally, the pilgrims, they, they come together and they were all Protestants. They protested against the papacy because they all recognized the papacy to be the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. They came to this new land to have a new start. Amen? Not to try to create war and overthrow a, a, another country. And so, 
But you know, when you have two different kinds of people from two different kinds of backgrounds dwelling in the same place, there's going to be some contention, is there not? You don't believe me? How many of you have ever lived with family? <laughs> Raise your hand. You ever live with family? Now, I don't know about you, but I've had to live with family a lot in the ministry in different times. I've had to move in for here or that because the ministry just doesn't pay a lot of money sometimes. And, and, but I, I don't care about that. I'm just laying up my treasures in heaven. Amen? No doubt about that. And there's been times my wife and I have had to stay with other people. And when you stay with other people at times, you may not be at odds with that person, but you stay there long enough and you're going to have some contention. Can you say amen? And that's what happened between the, the, the pilgrims and, and the Native Americans that were already here is that some, who, it doesn't matter who started it. You stay in the same land having two different ideas of how that land should be ran and, and, and different territories, you're going to have issues. And that's exactly what happened. But we didn't come to this country saying, oh, let's go take over those Native American people, as some people want to say we did. In fact, friends, our country, when we were finally established, we wasn't trying to conquer anyone. We were welcoming people. How many of you know what this is? This is the Statue of Liberty, amen? How many of you know what the Statue of Liberty is all about? Does anyone know? Raise your hand if you know. Well, I'm going to get to share with those, well, those of you that don't know, you're going to get to find out what the Statue of Liberty is really all about. When you go visit the Statue of Liberty, what is written on the Statue of Liberty is these words. Give me your poor. Now, keep in mind, look at the Statue of Liberty. What is it doing? Holding up a light. Give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe what? Free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these homeless tempests tossed to me. I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. Were we trying to conquer another nation? Or are we welcoming people into our nation? We were welcoming people. We were saying, hey, listen, you need a home? You want to be free? You want to live away from that? Come and be free. Now, sadly to say, the devil crept into this country early on and he started to create those anti-equality maxims in the veins of many different people. Isn't that right? He did, didn't he? And before you know it, all of these different terms of slavery, all of these different terms of inequality, all these different terms of partiality began to creep into the minds of our people who was supposed to be about freedom. And you started to see the United States change very quickly, did you not? Yes. Definitely. Now, we're going to get to that in just a moment. But check this out. This is a young nation. So we know we didn't conquer another world power in our eyes. But we are a young nation. Are we still a young nation today? Yes. You see, considered amongst all the other nations that have been around for a lot longer than we are, thousands of years, we are only several hundred years old, no doubt about it. And so this is a very young nation. We see here in Revelation 13, verse 11, he says, I beheld another beast. What's that, what's that term there? coming up out of the earth. That same term coming up is what you would see there to represent a flower coming up in its process of growth. Now, does a flower grow immediately or does it take some time? It takes some time. And so we are a young nation, no doubt about it. Number five, you see no crowns and no kingly authority on this beast. Isn't that right? No crowns and no kingly authority. You see, the first beast has crowns. Crowns indicate kingly authority. But there are no crowns on the horns of the second beast. This is significant. The second beast is described to have two horns like a what? Like a lamb. So in some way, this, this nation would have Christ-like characteristics. In some way. Did we as a nation, starting out, have Christ-like characteristics starting out? Yes, indeed. You know, even on our money, we put what? In God we trust, which brings me to my next point. We have the political principles, or we had the political principles of Christianity and, and, our, and our growth as a country starting out. Freedom. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Before then, you didn't hardly see any nation wanting to bring absolute freedom to, to its people. Isn't that right? Before then, there was slavery, there was all these issues, and yes, 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 and I hate to say that about our country, devil crept in, and yes, slavery and all these other things started to take, take its, its, its sprout and grow. But at the beginning of the forefront of our country, we had the right idea, did we not? We had the right idea, but anytime you bring in a right idea, there's going to be a devil there to try to pro create problems. Isn't that right? So, friends, we had freedom. How many of you are proud to be an American today? 
I'm proud to be an American because of the form of what our country was founded upon, but I'm not proud where our country's going. Can someone say amen? Where our country's going is a place that I'm not proud of because we have vastly been changing as a nation very quickly. You see, friends, we started out as a country that was supposed to, com to commit to ideas and stay to ideas of equality, freedom, and absolute create a, a form of absolute happiness to, a, to where a person could seek and find happiness on their own time in their own way. Because we come from a nation that was we, we come from nations that were persecuted by an antichrist system. But slowly but surely, our nation has been changing. How many of you can say that? You can say, I've seen that in my lifetime. No doubt about it. Let me ask you a question. How influential is the United States of America? How influential is this beast? Very influential. Let's look at what the Bible says of how influential it is. Revelation 13 and 12. It says, and he causes the earth and those that dwell in it to worship the first who? The first beast. Who's the first beast? The papacy. So this beast, this nation, this country, according to the Bible, causes the earth and those that dwell in it to worship the first beast, the papacy, whose deadly wound was healed. You may be saying, no way. Not in this country of freedom that we have. Well, friends, this country that was supposed to be found on freedom isn't that much free anymore. It's really not that free anymore. You know, what you see in our society today is that you see our constitution, our laws, everything that's supposed to create a free society, you're seeing that tore down right before our eyes. What have we gotten to when someone can't even put the Ten Commandments of God up and, as a statue or a monument and say, Amen, praise the Lord, that's what I believe in. And someone else comes along and they look at that and go, Well, that offends me. Well, then don't look at it. Amen? I walk by a Buddhist statue and I say, that's offending to me, but I don't want to force that person to have to take down their statue because they have the freedom to worship whoever they want. Can you say amen? To do whatever they want. I walk into a gas station nowadays and most of them are ran by people from other countries nowadays and we see they have their Hindu statues up of their elephants and, 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 and all these different things that they worship and, and I see that and I think, man, you know, that this is, I, I wish this wasn't here but I'm not going to tell them you need to take it down because I don't believe that way. That offends me. Amen? I don't want someone to force me and tell me how I should worship. Can you say Amen? And so check this out. This beast, the United States of America, would begin to cause, and that word cause there is actually the, the word for force, would begin to force the world to worship the papacy and to even go as far as to accepting the papacy's mark, which is the mark of the beast. Friends, we're going to learn about what that is tonight. But our country is vastly changing. Moving on to number seven. It becomes a global power. Is the United States a global power? Yes. We have our hands in everything. Many of the things that our hands are in, we don't need our hands in. Can someone say amen? We're getting our hands into everything nowadays, and it's causing this country more turmoil, more strife, and more problems than what we need to really have. We see in Revelation 13, verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. Spoke like a what? So it started out, two horns like a lamb would symbolize that this nation would have Christ-like characteristics at its forefront, but then it began to speak like a who? Like the devil himself. How does a nation speak? A nation speaks through its laws or its legislative body. Isn't that right? Friends, let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Now, I want to say this before I ask you this question. Listen very closely. I don't care if you're a Republican, nor do I care if you are a Democrat. Makes me no difference. I don't care if you're a Republican, and I don't care if you're a Demublican. <laughs> Makes me no difference. I could care less. So, that being said, I want to say this. Was this country founded 
as a democracy, yes or no? It was founded as a republic. Can someone say amen? Here's why I make this point. When we were kids, we had to get before, when we would go up to, to the classroom and we, before we would go to school, how many of you remember those days? You were a little kid, you went to school. They'd make you all sit down, and you sit there, you wait for the teacher to come in, the teacher would shut the door, and the first thing you would do was what? Pledge allegiance to the flag. You would all stand up, one hand over your heart, the other one behind your back in respect, and you would say, let's say it together, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the democracy for which it stands. <laughs> to the what? To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with unity, liberty, there you go, and justice for all. Are you with me? But our nation is getting away from liberty, and we're starting to get to this, I, this idea of let's all come together, not by liberty, but let's come together by forcing in the idea of unity. Is that true liberty? No. So, friends, our country was not founded on a democracy, and I don't mean to get all you know, political on you this morning, but here's the thing that I, I want us to realize. Because our country is changing from a republic and now we are becoming more of a democracy, you know what that's starting to do for the world and for our country? That's starting to say that no longer does a republic rule, but a democracy now rules in which the people decide where this country goes. The popular vote decides now where this country goes and what direction it heads. When, when you do that, has the, popu ha has the majority always voted well, yes or no? No. The majority in the Bible times have always been wrong. Can someone say amen? It was the minority who could see where this world was going and, and how we need to hold on to Jesus. It was the majority that cried it out, cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Can you say amen? And there was a small minority that was crying and weeping over it. Friends, we're living in a world, in a country that is becoming not a, not a republic, but has become more of a democracy in which the popular vote counts, which means that you lose your religious freedom, your religious rights, your religious everything when the popular vote votes against it. Are you with me? Don't believe me? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say I'm a baker, and I have my baking uh, company, and, and two people walk in one day, and they say, we would like you to bake me a cake. And I say, okay, well, what would you like on the cake? Well, this is my husband here. And the other guy looks to him and says, well, this is my husband here. And uh, we're going to be getting married soon, and, and uh, we're, we've set a date, and we would like you to bake us a cake and put the, you know, both of us on the front of it, try to make it look as much like us as we can, and, and uh, make sure that you... And, and, okay, now already, against the Bible, against my religious beliefs, if I bake that cake, I would be going against my religious beliefs. Can you say amen? So my religious conscience would then be defiled. And so, because I don't believe like that, and I don't want to support anything like that, I just politely say, I, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I love you guys, I really do, but um, that, that defiles my religious conscience, I can't, I can't bake this cake for you. So now, someone's offended. Are you with me? Someone's offended. Now, should we love everyone? Amen. But just because we love them, don't mean we have to agree with everything they believe. Amen. Amen. And so now somebody's been offended, and now they're going to try to go to court, and they're going to try to force me to do something that defiles my religious conscience. Has that happened, and is that happening in our country right now? Yes, and it has been for the last six or seven years. Where's the freedom at? Where's the freedom of religion at? 
Where's the freedom to worship as you would worship, to do as you would do, as long as you're not breaking any laws of the land, you're, you're, you're not defiling anything, you're, doing, you're, you're, you're a law-abiding citizen. Where is all the laws that we had established in this great country going? In the trash. Because now a democracy has been formed into the form of we have now let the popular vote win. Somebody's offended, have mercy, we can't have that. And so we got to do something about it so that we can get rid of all of this offensive stuff out there in the world. You post something online to YouTube, to Facebook, we're going to take that down because we don't like it. You tell people that the Antichrist is the papacy to warn the world, that's offensive to the papacy. Let's take that down. That's what's happening right now in our country. There is ministers in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that's posting truth, that's putting information out there, and the country, the, the people, is saying, no, nope, we don't want that out there. Taking it down. But what if that's what you believe? They don't care what you believe. You either believe what popularity says, or you will find yourselves persecuted and as an outcast, and even thrown in jail. How many of you remember that lady? Yes, she was working for the state, but she wouldn't marry that couple. And she was thrown in jail back in 2016. You want to remember that? What, what's happened to our country? Why didn't they just get another person to marry them that was okay with it? No, you see, they wanted to force their beliefs on that woman. And the country, this great country we're in, was fine with that. Has our country changed? Yes. A nation speaks through its laws or its legislative body, friends. Revelation 13 and 12 says, And he, speaking of the second beast, the United States exercises all the authority of the what? The first beast in his presence. We're talking about an in presence, a literal in presence alliance, coalition between the United States and the papacy. Have we been seeing that? Definitely. It says, And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, the papacy, whose deadly wound was healed. Friends, if you don't believe me, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Don't believe me. Believe your own eyes. Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Obama. Are we seeing a trend? Definitely. Friends, this great nation is changing. And quite frankly, it's not much of a great nation anymore. I'm just... I'm just speaking to you frankly. Our nation is changing. I love America. I'm very patriotic in, in the sense of what America was founded upon. Don't get me wrong. But I don't like how we've been changing as a nation. You see, this picture here says it all. Pope John Paul II, Bush, his father Bush, who was also president before him, and Clinton. Three live presidents at the funeral of the most powerful man in the world, the pontiff. You don't see when our presidents die, you don't see the popes coming over here to be president at their funeral, do you? You don't see, you don't see the pontiff bending down and bowing down to kiss our president's ring. Have mercy. What do you see? Our presidents kissing their rings. And no, not all the presidents have done it, but some have. Friends, it's going to show just where we are in history. Rolling Stone magazine, Pope Francis, right on the front page. The title right below his name, it says, The Times, They Are A-Changing. I couldn't agree more with that. Amen? Times are a-changing. Very quickly. You have Time Magazine. They call Pope Francis the People's Pope. Not the Catholic's Pope, the People's Pope. We invited Pope Francis to come and speak to the United States Congress in 2015. And what happened? He spoke on unity and solidarity in this great country. And to be formed in what way? We're going to talk about that tonight when we talk about the Mark of the Beast as to what way he really means to form this together. But I'll go ahead and give you a small preview. It's under the ecumenical movement. 
to ban the world and all the religions together under the banner of the papacy, where once again the papacy is becoming the head of the state once again. He spoke to the most powerful men and women in the world, the United States Congress. He met with our current president several times, Donald J. Trump. Why? What is this really about? Why are we meeting with the Roman pontiff? Why isn't he staying to himself? Why is he meeting with all of the world leaders right now? What's happening behind these closed meetings, behind these private meetings? I'll tell you, friends, Revelation 13 is happening behind doors. An alliance has been formed between these two great nations to band together the world to prepare them for the final scenes of earth's history. We need to get ready. Time is short. Revelation 13 and 14 says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the what? Of the beast. Miracles will be done in the end to deceive God's people. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. It says, These are the spirits of devils working miracles. Many people these days and these last days and many churches and denominations around who claim to be Christians is going to be deceived by these miracles of the devil because they're not studying Bible prophecy. They will be deceived just as the scribes and the Pharisees were deceived. They won't be ready. And friends, the question that I have for all of us, including myself, is are we studying to show ourselves approved? 2 Timothy 2 and 15 it, Paul admonishes us and admonished Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. A what? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. The problem is, friends, a lot of us aren't workmen. We're lazy men. We're not wanting to study the Bible. We're not wanting to study the Scriptures. And friends, I'm not speaking about you specifically. I'm speaking about the world together. We're not getting prepared. Amen? You see people nowadays, they're so biblical ignorant. Not only are they biblical ignorant, the most basis of the Bible is the gospel. They're gospel ignorant. They don't even understand the true beauty of the gospel. Believing that we're going to continue on living in sin. And that Jesus saves us in sin rather than from sin. Have mercy. He does not save us in sin. You cannot be saved in sin. That is totally wrong. It's impossible. You can only be saved from sin. Make no sense if I told you I'm saved from snakes. I'm saved in snakes. And I got snakes all around me biting me all the time. What sense does that make? Zero. We're either saved from it, but we cannot be saved in it. Amen? That's true salvation. Everything's being perverted nowadays. Paul spoke of every wind of doctrine that would be blowing, and every wind of doctrine is blowing. We need to be ready. We need to be training our minds, training our hearts. And our trainer is Jesus. We need to let Him train our minds and our hearts to prepare us for the times that are coming. It's saying that He had miracles, which He had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth, that's you and I and the rest of the world, that they should make, and what? Image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. Speaking of the papacy, that we should make an image to the papacy. Check this out. Revelation 13 and 15. And he had power to give life into the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. Is there going to be a slaughtering in the last days? Yes. I don't mean to scare any of you, but that's the reality. Friends, we need to be ready for what's coming. The image to the beast that it's referred to here in Revelation 13 is the image that the papacy set up that was like no other nation before it. The image here that it's speaking of directly is the alliance of church and state amalgamation. Are you with me? There was no other nation before the papacy that ever pulled that one off. 
to force religion upon the people in the, in the sense that cre- would create the dark ages. Friends, that's the image is speaking of that our nation would allow church and state amalgamation once more. That religion would be forced upon the people. Did you know what's already happening? I grew up in high school not too long ago. I sat in a high school and I, I had biology class and my biology teacher taught me his religion. I thought religion couldn't be taught in schools. Taught me his religion. He set me down and set the rest of our class down and he said, now I want to let all of you know that we should never believe in faith, we should believe in facts. We're all sitting there as Christians going, what? And he began to explain how facts is science. And that's all we can really believe in is the things that are tangible, that make sense, and that that we can really see. And I started asking this guy. I said, really? I said, "Um, let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian? He refused to answer that question. He said, I'm a fact believer. I was like, well, that's my answer there. If he's a Christian, he would have said, yes, I'm proud to be one. So I began to ask him a couple of questions. I said, where did the wind come from? He started trying to give me this answer. Hot and cold fronts form in the atmosphere and they blow down and then then they meet, they create a gust of of wind and it blows down and that's where we feel the hot and cold winds and the hot and cold air. I said, okay. I said, where did the hot and cold gusts come from that created that, that started that? It starts going back and back and back and back and back. Before he knew it, he had no logical answer. Why? Now, why is it that this man was able to teach me his religion? You have to have more faith to believe in evolution than you do in Christianity. Evolution says a big bang happened. Well, where did it come from? It come from nothing. That's what they teach. It come from nothing. Well, you can believe you come from nothing if you want. I choose to believe that where there is an intelligent design, there's an intelligent designer. And so religion is already being forced up on our kids in public schools today, upon our children. Telling and, uh, these professors, many of them are so intelligent that they just woo our children. They have, I mean, they have these like, brilliant Einstein brains, and 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 the, these kids they sit out and they're just in awe at how how brilliant these professors are, and so they really start buying in. Do you know what? He's making some good points. We really can have an answer for everything. In Christianity, there's so many questions. And they start to get confused and they start to get deceived into this idea that there's no God at all. Atheism is all it is, friends. It's being taught in our schools. Not only have we made an image to the beast, or we're making an image to the beast in the form of amalgamation of church and state, we have literally made an image to the beast. Revelation 13 and 16 says, And he causes all both small, great, rich, and poor, free, and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You're saying, Dakota, you mean to tell me our great nation, the United States of America, a nation that was based upon freedom, is going to force the entire world to accept this mark of the papacy. Absolutely. The Bible says it. You say, how could this happen in a land of freedom? Well, friends, you have to come this afternoon to know just how it's going to happen. Amen? You say, what is the mark of the papacy? Well, you have to come this afternoon at 5.30 to find out. Amen? I want to say this in closing. Friends, tribulation, tribulation doesn't necessarily build character. Are you with me? Tribulation doesn't necessarily build character. Tribulation reveals character. Can you say amen? What's coming with this mark of the beast is going to reveal who is true and who is false. 
it will be the ultimate outward test that will reveal who is true and who is false. Who has been professing with their lips while their heart is far from God. It's going to reveal all of that. The reality with this is, is that, you see, you and I, we are all like a sponge. Can you say amen? We're soaking up everything that we can, whether it be good or bad or whatever. When the mark of the beast comes, that's going to be the force that squishes you and me. If you were to take a sponge and you were to take a, put that sponge down into water, pull it back out of the water and squeeze that sponge and put the force to it, what's going to happen? Water's going to come out. Amen? But if you were to take that sponge and you were to apply that force to that sponge before and then enter it into the testing waters and pull it back out, what happens? Nothing. Nothing comes out. Are you with me? Likewise, when the mark of the beast comes, and it is coming very quickly, when it comes, that's going to be the force that's going to show you and I and the rest of the world what is in us. Are you with me? It's going to prove that when we're squeezed, if we're in Jesus, then Jesus will be in us and Jesus will come out of us. Can you say amen? That is what will be revealed in our character. But if we don't have Jesus in us, we have self in us. And when we are squeezed, Jesus won't come out. It'll be a big bowl of nothing. And we will fall into the deception that is impossible to come back from. The Bible says that whoever receives the mark of the beast will receive the full wrath of God of Revelation 16. The wrath of God is poured out upon the men and women who receive the mark of the beast. Friends, it's the seven last plagues poured out upon them. Let me tell you something. I've studied those plagues and we're going to study those plagues together. They are horrible. I'm not trying to motivate you into fear, obedience by fear, but I'm just trying to educate you right now. Amen? We need to be ready for what's coming. So friends, like a sponge, soak up as much Jesus as you can. Amen? That way when that pressure hits us, Jesus will come out of us. Amen? Amen. That's my appeal to you this morning. We're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to have a break and then we'll come back for our next, uh, our, our next uh, session uh, titled Revelations Blueprint in just a few minutes after we go through our, our service program. So let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, we ask you now that you will help us to realize the seriousness of this message as it has been shared right now. God, so many people are wondering after the beast. But God, we are not wondering. We are here and we know who the beast is. We're not wondering anymore. God, we know the truth. But Lord, although we know the truth, the question is not do we know it as much as it is do we have it. Do we, really, do we really have it in our lives? Are we abiding in it? So, Father, I pray that you will convict us all strongly to surrender our life to you. Lord, if there be any problems and struggles and, and uh, rebelliousness in our heart and our mind, Lord, banish it from us. God, change us and mold us. Give us new desires. Give us new motives. Lord, and help us to truly seek you like we've never sought you before, that we will be prepared for what is coming upon this world. Lord, that we will not be found like those in Noah's day. You compared your last days to Noah's day. Father, we will not be like them, but here comes the tribulation, and we are not found inside the ark. Oh, Lord, help us to be found inside your son Jesus when this tribulation comes upon us. We pray and ask you all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.